Jenny from Road Trip Nation and welcome to Cross Section. Cross Section is a live event series all about exploring your interests um, and showing you cool jobs that connect to things that you love. And today we're talking all about gaming. So I'll be your host today and we're actually here with a special guest, Dylan Price, AKA Attach. How's it going, Dylan? Hey everyone, hey Jenny, how you doing today? Good, good, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, it's great. I'm excited. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of fun stuff today. I can't wait to get into it. Yes, I'm excited too. But before we get into that, um, let me introduce to you my co-host, Carla. Hey Carla, how's it going? Hey everyone. Hey Dylan, hey Jenny. Hey Carla, how you hey. doing? Doing well, ready, ready for this good, conversation. Good. <laughs> Same. All right. So later today, Carla and I are going to talk to our friend Maya Tuttle, the voice actor who's voiced some of your favorite characters from Brawl Stars, Final Fantasy, and more. And later on after that, we're going to dive into the intersection of gaming and computer science and talk to Khalil and Ahmed Abdullah, the game developers who founded Decoy Games and created the multiplayer underwater shooter Swim Sanity. Here at Road Trip Nation, we love exploring the intersection of interests and showing you jobs and career paths you may have never thought of. So we're super excited to hear from the Abdullah brothers about how game development can combine your love of gaming with the fast growing field of computer science, resulting in a really cool job. So first, like I mentioned, we've got our special guest, Dylan. Dylan, also known by his gamer tag Attach, is a professional Call of Duty player for the Minnesota Rocker. He was also the youngest player ever to win a professional Call of Duty championship at the age of 18. You may also know him from his YouTube channel where he interviews fellow gamers and shows you tips and tricks to help make you a better Call of Duty player. Dylan, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, Call of Duty is great. I love Call of Duty, so I'm ready to talk about all things video games and Call of Duty today. Nice, nice. We're, that's what we're here for. We're going <laughs> to dive into your story a little bit, um, Dylan, but first, we want to play a game with you um, with, that we love to play with our guests. It's called GPS, Gotta Pick Something. Okay. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> all right. So what you're going to do is I'm just going to give you two options and you got to pick one or the other. So, okay. first off, do you prefer playing just for fun or playing in a tournament? Tournament, for sure. Nice. Call of Duty Modern Warfare or Call of Duty Cold War? <laughs> um, Cold War overall. But Warzone is like kind of Modern Warfare, but it's like not officially, so I don't know. But probably Cold War overall. Okay, sweet. What about being on a team or working solo? Being on a team, a lot more rewarding when uh, you find success. I agree. PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series? Oh, this is a tough one. Honestly, <laughs> I'd probably have to go with PS5. Sweet. Uh, what about traveling for tournaments or playing close to home? Traveling for tournaments. I love checking out new places and experiencing new cultures and stuff. It's uh, Traveling is one of the best things to do. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. What about be in a city with absolutely no technology or nowhere with the best Wi-Fi connection and your gaming setup? Probably for my career, I would have to pick in the middle of nowhere with the best internet and gaming setup or I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to play Call of Duty too much. So definitely in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, totally. All right. What about standalone games or game series? Ooh. Game series. Cool. Game chat on or off? Always on, always on. You never know what's gonna happen. It's all, it's it's most of the time a good time. It can get a little crazy though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about controller or keyboard? Ooh, controller. I'm controller gang for sure. Mm -hmm. Play a campaign or play battle royale? Ooh, battle royale. Nice. Uh, playing a game with a set story or playing a game where you influence the story? Hmm. Influencing the story. It feels like you're more into it. Yeah. Cool. Okay, last one. Learn how to develop your own video games or 
or master other developers' video games? Probably master other developers' video games, kind of like what I'm doing now. Um, I think it's just really fun and rewarding when you do when you do it. Yeah, totally. Um, we do have a question. One more GPS <laughs> question: um, salty or sweet snack when gaming? Salty or sweet snack? Probably, <laughs> probably salty. Cause like if I'm eating some sugar, like I might crash a little bit. So maybe some pretzels, <laughs> maybe some pretzels instead of some candy. I don't know. Yeah, good choice, good choice. Um, all right, well, yeah, that was it. That thanks for playing GPS. Um, that was fun. Was easy. Now that we've gotten fun. to know you a little bit more, um, can you just start off with telling us a little bit more about your story? How did you get started as a professional gamer? Uh, getting started in gaming, it all started when I was 10 years old and I first found out what Call of Duty was, or I played COD 4 at my friend's house. He was on my baseball team, mm -hmm. and the moment I played COD 4, uh, I knew I was in love. I really enjoyed the game. I instantly went home after and knew I needed to get an Xbox 360 because that's what it was at the time. And then I kind of started finding out about um, competitive games you could play on Call of Duty on this website called Game Battles. And I was like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. And people like play in actual tournaments. Back then, it wasn't for too much money. Like you'd win maybe a hundred. $200 in these tournaments that you entered um, but then I saw you can have like there was live streams of these events that were happening in person so people would travel to like Las Vegas or Texas and play tournaments and I'd watch that live stream and I would see them on this little stage now the stage grew a lot bigger but I was like thought it was the coolest thing ever and I really ignited like this passion for me to want to go pro in call of duty and uh i just I, I saw that there was like a future in it and being a pro player i didn't know if you'd be able to make good money doing it but it was just my passion at the time mm -hmm. and i really loved it and then when i was able to go to my first major mlg event in uh 2013 which was at the mlg anaheim convention it was at the anaheim convention center uh wow. i met some people and i did pretty well myself and I like kind of knew like, okay, this thing is getting serious. Like I can actually make it pro because I beat some people that were once pro and some decent players. So I knew I had it in me. Uh, you just got to find the team and the right players around you. So I started climbing the ladder, traveling to more events, getting better placings, placing in the top eight of these major tournaments and um, just improving as a player. And when you do that, people want a team with you. Organizations, they would like pay for your flights, your hotel for the weekend. And you would go there and like wear their jerseys mm -hmm. and represent them at the event and then also on like social media. So that's how a lot of uh, players got to these events early on because it's not cheap, of course. But uh, yeah. with the help of the organizations and placing really well and winning, they were able to sponsor you and uh, make your way up. And then in 2015 is when I ended up winning the world championship with my team denial. I was still a senior in high school at the time when I won it. And uh, it, was, it was a crazy year. Mm -hmm. I was traveling so much because we had multiple tournaments in France, multiple tournaments in London, and just everywhere around the US as well. So, so much traveling while still being in school. And then after that, I decided to not go to college. Uh, maybe one day I'll go, but for now, just really focusing on this gaming and uh, see how far I could take it and going to these tournaments, traveling, and it's been an awesome, the, the people I've met, the opportunities I've gotten, and uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't change or trade it for the world. Yeah, no, that sounds like a dream job. I think you're doing what most people <laughs> want to be doing, traveling, you know, playing Call of Duty, which is your passion. Um, but Okay, that jump from like playing for fun to playing in these live tournaments in front of a crowd, that's like a huge step up. So yeah. for anyone out there who's like considering your career, um, what was it actually like entering the world of professional gaming? And like, how was it different than you imagined? Uh, it was crazy because when you're at home, you're playing at home, you're comfy, there's no one watching you. I mean, nowadays you can like live stream on Twitch and do live streams like this and people can watch live as it's happening. But back then, like when I first started playing, there wasn't really anything like that. So when I went to my first event, I'm not going to lie, I was kind of nervous, got the butterflies a little bit. But I like thought to myself, you've played this game so many times, you've practiced this situation so many times, don't overthink it, just go in and do your thing. And um, I played really well because of it. Because when you start overthinking, it can lead to some bad plays and yeah. some losses and stuff. So 
I just want to be comfortable, do my thing, not overthink it. And honestly, the best moment is when there is a huge crowd watching you, but when you're just so focused in on the game with your team and everything you're doing, you don't even like realize like it's just you in your setup on the main stage. That's it. There's yeah, no yeah. like you just you're just so zoned in. That's like the best feeling. Oh, nice. You're you're totally in like flow state, right? When you're doing like, that. Yeah pretty much in a flow state. So whenever you can get into that, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so how has it changed or evolved over the past few years of your career? Yeah, it's went from being early on in my career before, right before I was pro and starting to go to these tournaments, there'd be like 50 to a hundred people in the crowd watching at these convention centers. And, uh, recently like we've had tournaments at the forum in Los Angeles, the Amway center in, uh, Orlando, I believe in Florida where the magic play. And now we're the call of duty league. The CDL is a franchise league. So there was a huge buy-in for all these teams to get in millions and millions of dollars. And the team I play for now is the Minnesota rocker. This is our logo right here. Uh, they, are actually the owners of the Vikings. So a lot of like major sports owners invested in Call of Duty or Overwatch or other franchise uh, video game leagues. And I was formerly playing for the New York team last season, which was owned by the owner of the Mets. So it's it's pretty crazy to see like Call of Duty become a real franchise thing. And now like I'm the Minnesota rocker. So a lot of people from Minnesota will be supporting this team and uh, myself yeah. just because I joined the team. So it's been really cool to see the growth, not from people that are just playing Call of Duty and passionate about that, but from the people in Minnesota that love to support, or the people that are in New York that live there that want to support their team. It's been awesome to see that yeah, growth yeah. and uh, hopefully, hopefully going to keep trying to make it bigger and do well. So people 10 years from now can be playing professional call of duty. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Um, I, I do remember you saying, you know, you, you talked about like kind of living this double life in high school, um, doing school during the day and then like gaming at night, your classmates had no clue you're going to become one of the best players in the world. What was that like? Um, like kind of just grinding away at your dream in secret. And what was it like when people started finding out who you were? Yeah, so before we really got into high school, my friends and I would always play. Like, I'd go over to their house, we're playing Call of Duty, and like we would play like competitive games too. So, like, my close friends knew I played competitive games, but by the time we got into high school, most of most of them all quit, and I was just like, I loved it. So I would just keep on going, and going crazy, and my friends would call me on the weekends, like, "Yo, you want to hang out or do something?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm sick," and I pretty much said I'm sick for the whole year, <laughs> and I was just at home playing Call uh... of Duty, and I'd be perfectly fine on like the Monday of school, but I was just embarrassed because gaming wasn't like cool back then, like yeah, it, like it is now. Like, a lot, everyone's very open about it. All the athletes, the rappers, the whoever it may be, everyone talks about video games openly. But back then, no one really did it as much. And you were kind of seen as like nerdy and stuff. And I, yeah. I definitely felt that way a little bit. And then transitioning from people finding out was like my junior year. People were just like, where is Dylan? Like he's gone like on Thursday, Friday, and then Mondays of multiple weekends on school. Like where is this guy going? And then there was a Fox Sports <laughs> article that got put out and it was titled like gamer or student by day, gamer by night. And I think some of my friends kind of saw that and started like telling people where kind of got around. And then um, in the, my senior year when I was like – on a top team uh, doing pretty well. People just started finding out because they would follow my Twitter. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, I had two Twitters. I had a real life Twitter and then a gaming Twitter. <laughs> Eventually, I, I deleted my real life Twitter. I'm like, I don't need two Twitters. I yeah. just, I'll just use my gaming one. And so the senior year is when I started finding some major success is that's when I won the world championship and a couple other tournaments that year. And it was awesome to see uh, my like my friends also support me. Like Everyone in the school support me. And then my... Um, like the school itself, like the people that worked there in the front office, I when I won the world championship, I went back to school like a week later and because we had like a break during that time. I didn't ditch school for a week. Don't worry. I went back a week <laughs> later and uh, I was in class and they called me in. The yard duty came and picked me up from my class. I was like, oh, God, what did I do? Or what are they going to say? Are they going to say I can't like keep going to these tournaments and missing school? But they actually had a poster from the world championship that was played in Los Angeles that I won and they just asked me to sign it and stuff and then uh, they put oh, it up. So awesome. that was really cool. Yeah, it was it was really cool to have like support of 
the people at my school, my friends, and everyone in that community uh, about it. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. I love that you had like so many supporters. Um, I know, you know, your mom had admitted that she wasn't always like super supportive of your career. And I think a lot of people who want to pursue professional gaming probably know that same feeling. Um, what's your advice for people out there who like are maybe feeling or being told that their gaming dreams aren't legitimate? Uh, here at Road Trip Nation, we call that the noise, you know, just like people saying what you should, what you uh, you shouldn't do um, and not really take into consideration like who you are. So yeah, what what are some words that you have for some other people who might be feeling the same? Yeah, no, it's completely understandable that people would question it. My parents would question it all the time back then. And uh, back then there wasn't these huge spectacular tournaments going on for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Players weren't being salaried in these leagues and just to play professionally like they are now. So it was definitely a real concern like because everyone, all the parents and uh, guardians want the best for their uh, for their children and their people they're watching over. Mm -hmm. um, to just make sure they're making the right like, right steps, taking the right steps, making progress in life. So it's completely understandable. Yeah. But now the nice thing is that you can see these tournaments where people are winning hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of one weekend or over the course of a season. Uh, these tournaments yeah. are just packing out whole stadiums of people just spectating to watch. So it's a lot more official now. And I think it would be much easier. It would have been much easier for me if um, they had like these huge things back then because I tried yeah. everything to tell my parents uh, like my mom would take me to these <laughs> tournaments that were like local so that was actually a huge help in just improving as a player and meeting people in the scene but there wasn't anything like playing at the forum or at the amway center yeah. or playing in this huge franchise league um so there is evidence and proof that it is a thing now and it can be done with like the hard work and determination um but yeah it was it was definitely a little stressful at times i have a lot of funny stories of my parents telling me to get off the game back when i was younger and now i'll be chilling on the couch uh, downstairs while i'm visiting them and they'll be like why aren't you playing right now like what's wrong with you so now it's like completely flipped they want me to be playing all the time but back then they want me to get off and make sure i was doing my schoolwork and play my sports yeah. and all that so it's, it's crazy how Aww. far it's come now yeah they're your number one fans they definitely are they definitely are <laughs> <laughs> oh well since then um you know you've really leaned into your skills and you're running this really successful and honestly like really helpful youtube channel um teaching others some of your tips and tricks why is it important to you to make time to engage with the gaming community and share all of your professional knowledge um, honestly, there's a couple reasons. One thing, Call of Duty in, for sure has been a big thing about building your brand. Like there's been p teams and people like Optic Gaming and Nade Shy and Scump who have, who are huge. I have hundreds of millions of followers across social medias and teams like FaZe Clan, which I was on for four and a half years. And they are just making videos that are just people fall in love with them and to support them throughout their journey on this professional gaming or YouTube, whatever they're doing. So there was always a very big emphasis on making uh, content and just having people like enjoy your story. That's the way I kind of always looked at it. Like if I'm going to be gaming and doing all this and traveling and meeting so many new people, why not put out live streams on Twitch or videos on YouTube that people can watch, interact with, and just like I can become friends with. Like there's so many people I've met at these events who have – uh, been in my live streams who I've seen multiple times at this certain event every single year and it's just been awesome to meet all these people but then also it that kind of depends on the person because there's all different types of content you can do personally I love Call of Duty and I love seeing people improve at Call of Duty so that's why I just put yeah. out the tips and tricks videos because there's no better feeling yeah, than when yeah. someone says oh I watched your video and it helped me get this many more kills or do this much better my team win this much or just make me love the game more so that's honestly like the best compliment you can get from someone just saying that you help them out and that's just kind of a thing i found a passion for within my passion of call of duty and it's just been a great experience but there's so many different types of content uh you could you can make in this gaming space and at these events when we can go to these major events again uh it's just been um yeah. Kind of, kind of a dream for myself and all the others who have been lucky enough to uh, make this a career. So you don't want to just let it go to waste. You want to make the most of it. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I love that, that you're sharing that with the community and you get excited for other people to improve. That's awesome. 
Um, I know I've been asking a lot of questions, so I'm going to take some audience questions. Uh, ben here asks, of all the people you've met who in the video game industry, who has the coolest job? Besides you, of course. But who do you <laughs> think has the coolest job that you've met? Um, okay, that's a tough one, Ben. The coolest job... I don't know, because I feel like that really depends on the person. Like, personally, like, I love gaming, so this would be my, like, if I love competing in gaming at the top levels. This would be my dream job. But then I met people who create games, which is incredible. Like, I would love to maybe one day create games. I probably am not smart enough to do that or have yeah. any kind of knowledge about that yet. So it would take some time. But creating games would be awesome. Uh, competing, it's like, I don't know who has the coolest job in the video game industry i feel like there's just so many different jobs you can do like you can find a job to be a manager of a team a coach of a team a caster that uh broadcasts over the matches and talks about it so you can find anything that fits what you want to do in the community so it's harder for me to really say one of the coolest yeah. jobs but i do <laughs> love competitive gaming yeah yeah awesome also um this is really cool agency says tell him thanks he made a video on um cod settings that totally helped me so awesome that you put that out um agency thank also asked does rocker have a thank team? You does oh, rocker sorry, have a team house and if so are they required to live there yes yeah, so with our team minnesota rocker uh, right now we are living in texas because a lot of the call of duty league is going to be online for the upcoming season and being in texas and having the best possible internet is very very important um we would be living in minnesota if we were probably back at our normal scheduled programming where we were traveling around to these tournaments doing stuff of course we can't do that at the moment so hopefully that comes back soon but they have a beautiful facility that's actually connected to where the minnesota vikings play and the facility is massive it's crazy I've, i haven't been there yet but i've seen pictures of it and videos of it and it's just insane it's huge so maybe one of these days we'll be going out to the uh, minnesota area and then going to the facility to practice and train but for right now we are all in apartments in texas in the same building but we each have our own apartment mm -hmm. Ah, I see, I see. Um, and then also Nathan asks, what is your typical training schedule like? Yeah, so with uh, gaming can be a little interesting. I would say you'd wake up anywhere from 10 to 11 a.m. And my team would, likes to go over VODs, some of our old practice games, or watch another team's VOD who's playing a situation or a a play really well and kind of learn from them and study so get on at 12 do that for an hour leading up into practice which is at one and then we'll play for some other pro teams in a set of the respawn matches we played and respawn matches is when like you have unlimited lives and the goal is for the first one hard point to get 250 points so it's like four or five different hills that move around each 60 seconds and you want to accumulate 250 points the first team that does that wins so that's what we play and uh, we practice versus teams throughout the day for probably five six hours in just team scrims go take a little break and then maybe hit the gym maybe eat some food uh, relax for a little bit and hop back on turn the stream on play some Pro 8s, which is kind of like a pickup basketball game, but for Call of Duty, and just get some more practice uh, in. You could play, you could play online tournaments as well. Um, you could watch some more VOD, or you could just play some public matches, some Warzone, and just have a good time and uh, just relax. But there's a lot of things you can do, but you're always looking to try and improve and use that time to just become a better player and team. Yeah, nice. Thanks for answering those. Um, we only got a couple minutes left, so I wanted to ask you, what is your biggest tip for people playing the new Call of Duty Cold War? The biggest tip for the new people playing Call of Duty Cold War, this is a tough one because I, I could go on for days of all the tips there can be. Um, oh, yeah, definitely okay. make sure you, when you're playing, you of course have your weapons ranked up so you have all the good attachments. And then when you're actually in the heat of battle in the game, Make sure you're pre-aiming, not just running around like a uh, headless chicken and getting killed for free. Like, you make sure you're pre-aiming, expecting the enemy team to push up, and so they don't catch you off guard. You catch them off guard, and you're able to win. So pre-aiming, then finding, like, a comfortable sensitivity and controller is very important to make sure you're accurate with your shots when you are pre-aimed up. So having good map awareness, pretty much, finding good settings to be comfortable playing with, and then, of course, just 
learning the game, taking that time to play a couple matches, learn the maps, learn where people are, the, like we learn where the hotspots are on the maps and where people are coming from. That's definitely the biggest thing because if you're predicting them before they predict you, odds are you're going to kill them. Or, yeah, uh, get the kill. That sounds kind of violent, but like you're going to get them in game. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. All right, cool. Um, we always wrap our conversations with this, but what is one piece of advice that you have for anyone tuning in right now, you know, getting into maybe in the video game industry or even what you're doing? What is one piece of advice you want to leave with everyone? One piece of advice for everyone getting into the industry, I guess it would kind of be whatever you want to do, what you can do it in this community. Um, you can be a videographer, photographer, a professional player, manager, maybe one day a team owner. Uh, there's so much opportunity to be something in this, in the esports world, in the gaming world. So don't get discouraged if it doesn't work out because it takes time. It takes a lot, a lot of time. Like when I started when I played when I was 10 years old, I didn't turn into a professional until I was, I just turned 17, I believe. So it takes a lot of time to become good at the game, of course, takes a lot of time to develop your skills and whatever it may be. But as long as you give it that time and effort, like it's not going to happen overnight. You just got to be, uh, you got to stay the process, stay the track, and you can make it work. So just don't give up. Believe in yourself, and you can do anything you put your mind to. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dylan. This has been so cool. The 15, 20 minutes went by super fast, but it was so it great did. to hear your story and just to hear, you know, what you're excited about. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Dylan. Thank you. Thank you for watching everyone. Have a good day. <laughs> All right. Have, have a, a good rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right, so that was really cool. Um, we're about to talk to our friend, Maya, who is a video game voice actor. Uh, but while we cue that up for you, I'm going to throw it over to Carla for our quote of the day. Thanks, Jenny. That was such a fun conversation. I know my little brother was there taking notes on everything Dylan was saying. At Roachip Nation, we love talking to people all over the country about their careers. They give us advice on their work, life, and everything in between. So today's quote of the day comes from our interview with Ahmed and Khalil Abdullah, who we'll be talking to later in this event. We first met with the Abdullahs while shooting our documentary film, At Your Fingertips, which is all about discovering careers in computer science. Check out what they had to say. How do you see what you do to be important in the industry or like, can you talk a little bit about what you think your impact would be? It's really about being a role model. We come across so many individuals, minorities and non-minorities alike, that are just, they're too smart not to have that creative confidence that to say, you know, I can go make games or I can go launch my own website, I can go launch my own tech business. There's strength in representation, there's strength in seeing someone as a role model. Mm -hmm. And right now, there's almost nothing there. And we have too many people who are into games. We have too many people who are intelligent enough to make games for that to be the case. When you see someone who looks like you in a space you hadn't imagined yourself in before, it's inspiring. It's empowering. And that's the strength in representation. We'll be talking to the Abdullah brothers later on, but right now we want to welcome our next guest. Maya is a voice actor who you may have heard in awesome games like Brawl Stars or Final Fantasy VII. Um, please, everyone, welcome Maya. Hey, Maya. Hey, everyone. Hey, Jenny. You're doing awesome. This it's, is so cool. Uh, <laughs> it's so good to see you, and this is so cool that we get to talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks for being here. So before we jump in, we want to do a speed round of fun questions so everyone can get to know you a little bit more. Um, so I'll just be shooting you rapid fire questions um, and then you can just let us know okay. what your answer is. How's that sound? Sounds good. I'm ready. All right. So first question, what's something weird you like to do to warm up your voice? Um, sometimes I sing the Daniel Tiger theme song uh, because it's so cute and my baby daughter li likes it. <laughs> I love that. Can you sing it for us real quick? 
I'll be back when the day is new and I'll have more ideas for you. And you'll have things that you'll want to talk about. I will too. It's very heartwarming. Oh <laughs> it's the closing God, theme. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for singing that. Um, okay, next question. What's the most memorable voice acting gig you've done? Um, I'm currently doing the, the quarterly announcements for PlayStation, which is pretty cool. Uh, they're called State of Play. So uh, it's like when they announce their new games and things. So sometimes yeah. a little bit beforehand, I, I know about these new games coming out, which is, is pretty fun. But I have to keep it a secret and throw away the key yeah. because I can't reveal anything before it comes out. But it's very cool. Yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. I know you love gaming as well. So what is your favorite video game? Oh, uh, definitely the Fallout 4 from Bethesda. Um, both my husband and I played a lot of it a couple years ago, and uh, we even had the, the theme song played at our wedding. We were so obsessed with the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, are you currently hooked on any particular game right now? Um, I just finished playing a game called Among the Sleep, where you play, you actually play a toddler, like a baby, and you're in a bad dream, and it's kind of scary, um, but it's very, very good. Uh, I even teared oh, up sounds... at the end. It's very beautiful. Aww. But before that, Red Dead Redemption 2. It's very, very good. Nice. Uh, would you rather have to shout everything or whisper all the time? I think whisper, even though I, I heard whispering's bad for your voice too, but yeah, whispers. I prefer whispering to shouting for sure. <laughs> Uh, would you rather be able to imitate people perfectly or imitate animals perfectly? Uh, oh, I would love to be able to imitate people perfectly because I would probably book a hundred times as many jobs <laughs> if I could sound nice. like J.K. Simmons or some, you know, old man or something like that would be amazing. Yeah. I could do any voiceover job in the world. <laughs> yeah, that would be really cool. That would be a great skill to have. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, who is your favorite character you voiced? I think probably Jessie from, from Brawl Stars. Supercell sent me her. Uh, this is Jessie and this is Scrappy. <laughs> but she's cool. She's like a techie. She's smart. Uh, she's wild and spunky. Uh, uh, Brawl Stars character, so I, I like her. Nice. Last question. Can you try to say, welcome to Road Trip Nation's cross-section series in Jesse's voice? Okay. Welcome to Road Trip Nation's cross-section series. Woohoo! Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Thanks for doing yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now that everyone's familiar with your talents, can you tell us a little bit more about your story and how you got into your career path? So yeah, so actually I used to work at Road Trip Nation. I interned there while I was in college and I was an editor. So uh, one day, I can't remember why, but we needed someone, we kind of do every, did everything in house. We needed someone to say the title open of the show, you know, like, welcome to, oh no, wait, this is Road Trip Nation. That's <laughs> what we had to say. So I ended up doing it just cause I think, cause I was there and, and then it was, you know, really fun. So I kind of like clocked that, like, oh, I like this. Um, and then I was also in a band at the time and my band got signed. So we went off to tour um, and all that. And I, my editing skills from road trip transferred over to music production skills. And I, I it was easier for me to learn the music software. Um, yeah. So it is the, when we were off tour one time, um, like when you're in the band, sometimes you have to do radio liners. So that's when like, you know, you go like, this is the colorist and you're listening to 96.5 The Buzz in Kansas City. We would have to do that sometimes. And I was like, oh yeah, I still like this voice acting thing. Mm -hmm. So we were home from tour once and I just took voiceover classes here in Southern California in Burbank. And um, my music production skills transferred really well to audio, just audio recording skills because it's basically the same thing. So it kind of gave me an yeah. advantage going into voiceover and um, especially, you know, doing everything from home now, it's like been super helpful. So yeah, it just kind of grew from there over the past five years. 
Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I know. Every time we hear your voice here, we always say, oh, it's angel voice Maya. So that's really cool that, you know, this is what you're doing now with all these different voices. It's fun. It's really cool. Um, I know you have um, some footage of your studio. Can you walk us through, you know, maybe a day in a life of of yours? And you know, uh, once the studio footage goes on, just walk us through what your studio looks like, what kind of setup you have, anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, so my studio is actually at my house in a room. So we have this, you'll see this big gray block. That's a six by four vocal booth called a whisper room um so i got my my desk in there i got my golden girls on the desk there they wish me luck my my fallout uh uh, power armor there um so i walk into the booth here got my mood lighting um stuffed animals also actually help with uh, absorbing frequencies that are you don't want um in the recording so i have uh, acoustic panels there it kind of all just helps make it a really tight sound once i close the door this is my interface. This this helps me connect my microphone to my computer. So my MacBook Pro is mm. outside the room, so you don't hear the fan or anything. That's my microphone. It's a U87. And I use Logic, um, which is what I used when I was making music and the same thing too. So I use Logic to record myself, record my voice, and I can send out the files um, uh, to a director or whatnot. Um, sometimes I'll do sessions where the director's calling in. I'm actually in the same booth right now. So the director calls in here and I just hear the person over my ears and then we re- do all the takes. It's kind of like, it's basically you're an actor, but you don't have to yeah. worry about what you look like, which is nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so what's your what's your process like for like a specific project? Can you walk us through that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it depends on whether it, it can go many different ways. Like for Final Fantasy, they actually brought me into the studio. So someone else is recording me um, and the director's in the same room. Um, and we'll just go line by line. I'll have the script in front of me. And usually you'll do different takes and the director will either guide you or be like, you know, yeah, that's that worked. <laughs> um, but most of the yeah. jobs I do, I record from this booth. So either a director will call in and um, uh, direct me line by line. I'll record everything here and I'll slate and label the takes so yeah. that I can send them all the takes at the end. Um, and then the other way that it can happen, because software is really cool these days, there's a software called Source Connect where an engineer, I'm here in Southern California, and an engineer in like Boston can take the direct feed from this mic and, and he or she can record it on that end. So I don't have to do any work. Mm-hmm. They just hear everything that's coming out of my microphone here. So yeah. there's a number of different ways you can go. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, I know you sent over some Brawl Stars footage. So let's take a look at that and maybe you can walk us through what we're seeing. Oh yeah, so this is uh, my character in the game. This is a mobile game. Time to get constructive. My voice here when you choose your character. Um, so oh, a director nice. remotely directed me on all these lines, um, and then I sent him all the lines afterward, and they programmed them into the game to be triggered by certain actions in the game. Um, this was me playing this this morning, and I'm, I'm not very good at Brawl Stars, but it's very fun. <laughs> um, but I played my character, Jessie, to kind of show you. Um, so, like, she kind of... she. She has a turret named uh, Scrappy. It's her sidekick. So when she puts it down, like... When she gets hit, you'll hear like, Oh, no! Yeah. And when she puts the turret down, you'll hear different sounds like, Where will I put my friend? Like, different things. <laughs> so when she gets hit, certain lines are triggered. When she's, like, looking for a place to put her turret, certain lines are triggered. and. Yeah. I did lots oh, of so cool. like, ah! you'll hear like all that in there. Yeah. Oh my God. But yeah, I recorded amazing. all these lines in this booth and then, yeah, they, they inputted them into the game to sort of uh, happen at different moments. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. It's so, it's so like trippy to hear like you in the game and then you talking to me right now because they're oh, yeah. like, you're like, hearing like, your voice here in, in the game too. <laughs> yeah. So cool. <laughs> 
Um, how, so how do you get into character like before, before you record? Um, it depends if, if, uh, if I know what I'm recording beforehand, I, I can have more of a chance to prepare. Like it sounds funny, but because there's like, um, NDAs and games are secretive sometimes, sometimes you don't know yeah. what you're voicing. Like that's what, that's what happened to me with the final uh, Fat fantasy game. The first time I worked on it, that. They call it something else, and then you don't even know what you just voiced. <laughs> they kind of oh, tell you in the I moment, see. like, you're this type of, you know, you're a little boy or you're a little girl in the street or, what, like, you're a shop owner. You kind of have to, like, um, they, they actually recommend you take improv classes if you're interested in, in getting into voiceover so that you can just, on the spot, come up with different oh. ideas and things like that. So sometimes oh, you don't have an totally opportunity sense. to get into character, but yeah, <laughs> it's a good challenge. Oh, got it. Got it. Nice. Um, okay. So the world of gaming hasn't always been, you know, super accepting of women, but with the rise of streaming and Twitch, it feels like women are carving out their own space. What's your experience been like as a voice actor for these games? Um, and also just as a casual gamer yourself, uh, have you faced any of these barriers or biases? Uh, yeah, I, where I especially see it is like there's not there's very few um, female sound engineers. It's like very few. Mm. So I I basically engineer myself when I'm doing a session like this. I'm, like I'm have to make sure that input levels are good and I'm not peaking and there's no distortion and that everything's getting recorded at the you know you know 24 bit 48k mono like all these specs. Um, but it's it's, I think I've only had one session out of like hundreds I've done where, some, where I'm being engineered by someone else that it was a woman. It only happened one time. Um, so, so a lot of these directors and people you uh, work with, they're not used to it. So sometimes I'll definitely be talked to like, uh, do you know what you're doing? Or, or, or kind of like <laughs> yeah, as if yeah. I don't know. So you kind of just have to, you know, be like calm and collected and, and kind of just show that you know what you're talking about and like do do the best yeah. job possible so that they can see oh yeah she did she knows what she's doing but yeah. yeah also another funny thing is when i started i was told by my teacher most jobs for commercials are voiced by men so you won't find as much work um i don't know if that's still the case but it's it's pretty crazy to hear those um like stats thrown at you but but I've I haven't had a problem. I, I think there's especially nowadays they're looking for more like female voices, more androgynous voices too. So it's definitely yeah. a, a new a new world, you know. Yeah, totally. Uh, I do want to get to some audience questions, and we've got one here from Sarah. Um, is there a voice actor that inspires you? Oh uh, yeah, like uh, John DiMaggio is really amazing and uh, watching his documentary mm -hmm. he can just do any voice um mm -hmm. uh yeah I, i'm inspired by i'm watching the uh the legend of Korra and avatar uh yeah uh, series right now <laughs> for research so everyone in those uh, tv series is just amazing yeah yeah oh we've got another question from molly do you drink a certain tea or anything to warm up your voice I should be drinking tea, I but I like coffee so much, and it's it's not the best for voice acting. But <laughs> I just love coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Um, I know that we have another exciting preview of something. So, um, can you talk a little bit about what you're working on right now? Oh yeah, um, this is a. Uh... Livy and Afterlife, and it's a VR horror game. It's going to be on like PlayStation VR, Oculus, all the, um, and Windows. But you're going through this old Hollywood mansion, and there's some sp supernatural spookiness going on. But I was remote directed by by the team in uh, Sweden uh, for this, and I'll, I'll be a companion in the game if you play. But it's it's very scary. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Very scary. What other? Um... Yeah, I know. I was watching this earlier and I was like, oh, wow. That's so cool. Yeah. If you uh, like what to other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what other projects are you working on? Um, so I mentioned the Avatar and Legend, Legend of Korra because um, I'm currently recording the audiobooks for Nickelodeon for them. Um, oh, my God. And so cool. 
the show is so good and I didn't really know about it before. So I'm like rushing to watch through them all right now. So I'm binging them and I'm having so much fun, but I just want to do a really good job and get all the pronunciations right. But it, it's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. Very cool. Oh, that's so cool. I know a lot of people are watching that right now. I'm like you, I'm trying to rush through that right now too, because I'm one of yeah. the last few to watch. All right. So yeah. we are coming up to time, but you know, we always want to close out with one piece of advice for um, that you would like to give to anyone who wants to get into what you're doing right now. Um, and any last words that you have? Um, I'd say, uh, like, you know, there's a lot of voiceover classes online and, and j uh, this is what I would, you probably heard this as a metaphor before, but that your voice is unique. Um, but in voiceover, I, I mean it literally, like your voice is unique. And so it makes it very special. Um, and you just mm -hmm. have to sort of, even if you think your voice doesn't sound good, I still, I feel like that sometimes there is no other voice yeah. like yours. And, and the more authentic <laughs> and real you can be the more you'll yeah. connect with an audience. So it's, yeah, be yourself and your voice is unique, literally. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Maya. So yeah, I know you are me. super busy because you're a new mom, um, but just really thank you for joining and having this conversation and just walking us through this. I don't think I've like sat down to hear what you do in this process. So this is really cool for me too, to learn what you do. Um, but yeah, oh, it sounds amazing. Fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yay. Have a great rest of your day, Maya. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Oh my gosh. That was so cool. Um, all right. So we're super excited about our final guest. They are the founders of indie game company Decoy Games. They develop Swim Sanity, an action-packed multiplayer underwater shooter game. I actually got to play recently and just found out how bad I was, but it was so, so fun. So really excited to welcome Ahmed and Khalil Abdullah. Thank you for joining us, you guys. What's going nice on, y'all? <laughs> Things are good. So I'm excited to dive into your story. But before we do that, um, just like we did with Maya, we want to do a speed round of questions. Um, so I'll just be shooting some questions for you and you'll just be answering them rapid fire uh, questions. So Khalil, I'll start with you. Who is the older brother? Me, by two years, but he's going to say a year and a half, but. Science says two years. It's just facts. I don't, I mean, I just, I just go by the numbers. I just go by the numbers. <laughs> nice. Ahmed, what was your first game console? First game console, uh, Nintendo, the original Nintendo playing Mario. That was our first game we played too. Yes. That was mine too. I love that. Khalil, what's your favorite game console? Oh man. Uh, favorite game console all time. I'm going to say Xbox 360, but Nintendo 64 is right there. Oh, nice. <laughs> Ahmed, who has won more Swim Sanity games? Oh, That's easy. Right I mean, you're talking to the champion right now. I mean, I always scrub myself <laughs> off the leaderboards just to make sure everyone else has a chance. But yeah, you'll see it today. I mean, I, I lead the charge. Now, I know I'm the younger brother, but someone has to step up. So, yeah. In front of all these people. <laughs> <laughs> that debate will keep going. Uh, Khalil, how often do you read fan feedback? Oh, all the time. That's like one of my main roles. So I'm, I'm always interacting with fans, you know, good or bad feedback. I'm here for it. Yeah. Nice. Ahmed, what's the longest you've sat playing video games? Ooh. Um, yeah, college, <laughs> Call of Duty, Modern Warfare, the original one, that was, I mean, I'd say maybe like 15, 18 hours. I mean, it's obnoxious. So oh, wow. yeah, that's all, you, that's all you do at college. You just like do, you do school stuff and then you just play games. That's what yeah. I felt. Nice. Khalil, how did you come up with the name Swim Sanity? Um, okay. This is supposed to be a rapid question. So. Uh, it was a silly game based off a Mario arcade game. Um, the Mar in the Mario game, you used to go to the bottom of the ocean and try to grab gold from a big octopus. In my version of the game, I added a bunch of different sea creatures. 
Um, and then we added a bunch of weapons and stuff like that. And it just was an insane game. And I'm corny, so I said insane and put it with swim. It was swim sane, but that wasn't insane enough. So then I made it with swim sanity. And you know, that's that's where we are here today. Nice. And I guess last one, were there any other names that didn't make, or what were the other ideas or names that didn't make the cut, Ahmed? Yeah, so that wasn't the full name he had. It was actually called Swim Sandy Muba Jiver, the Scuba Diver. And I was like, nah, that can't happen. We can't have that whole <laughs> name on there. So we cut that whole part off and kept his corniness to us a little bit. So we kept this Swim Sandy. I let him have that. Nice. I like that. All right. So you got through the rapid fire questions. Thank you both for playing that. Now that we know a little bit more about you, um, can you two tell us, you know, more about your story? How did you get started as game developers? Um, Ahmed, well, I'll go to you first because we started with Khalil last time. So a lot of people think you might have to go to a school in order to learn all these things. Uh, we did take computer science as our base, but we didn't have any classes that taught us how to create games. So out of college, we just went in and started researching online. You know, after we went to UMass, we basically went to YouTube University and, and searched a bunch of videos that had to get into game development. Um, and we used Khalil's projects from Sandy's. He talked about that he had as a flash project when he was in school. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to get on consoles. That was our main thing. We really want to be console game developers. Yeah. And we just kept researching and doing prototypes over and over and built these PC builds. And we went to little conventions. And eventually, once we got the attention you know, of these console publishers, we were able to secure contracts to get on the platform. So it was uh, it was definitely an experience to keep going through prototypes, but it was something where, especially now, it's a lot more accessible, the game engines yeah. and the content. So don't be afraid to just jump on there and get started on game development. Yeah, yeah. Um, Khalil, can you talk a little bit about um, having a full-time job while working on a passion project and like just learning your craft? Yeah, um, you know, one of the big things for us was to, well, when we first got started, we went to computer science and we chose to do that over getting like a game developer degree or a game design degree. Not that there's anything wrong with the game design degree if that's what you're doing, but we felt like it gave us a bigger like umbrella and some backup plans just in case like the game development thing didn't work out. And as you know, especially nowadays, every company needs um, somebody with a technology background. So, um, my first job coming out of college was actually being a solutions consultant um, selling healthware so healthcare software. Had nothing to do with my passion. Anybody who worked in that last job can tell you I did not like it. But uh, I, it helped pay the bills, um, helped keep food on the table while I was able to work on my passion job, Decoy Games, on the side. And mm -hmm. you know, while it was a bit of a longer process, it, it kind of gave us that foundation to really launch some sanity and Decoy Games the way that we wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you guys break down, you know, how to use computer science or like how it's used on like a day-to-day -day basis? Like give us a simple explanation of how computer science like works in the game development world. Which languages do you work in or what kinds of software do you use? Yeah, for sure. So we work in the Unity game engine, which is built with C Sharp. Uh, so it's object-oriented language, object-oriented scripting language. Um, and if you know Java, it's pretty easy to kind of jump into one another. But I feel like computer science is all about problem solving. So just ideas mm -hmm. of coming up with algorithms, knowing uh, knowing the problem, trying to figure out the solution, the best way to do it efficiently. Gaming is all about the same thing. So it really has a big cross section of there. As Khalil said, I really feel like computer science actually allows you to kind of think outside the box instead of just thinking in the game design aspect. Um, so really, we yeah. use our computer science skills all the time, every day when we're doing our work. Yeah. Um, and Khalil, what importance do you feel computer science has on your work or the world? Yeah, I think like just as far as a computer science degree, it really gave me the foundation, um, regardless if I was going to development or not, um, with coding, right, algorithm solving, mathematics, um, all the different tools that I needed to really like get my career off and going. And like Ahmed said, it's not so much like learning exactly the language of programming. It's teaching you how to problem solve in a tech fashion. So um, like you said, really that, that ability to problem solve, kind of open your mind to things that you might not have seen um, before you got into computer science was really big for me. Yeah. Um, and I know 
Khalil, uh, you said in the past that you didn't always have a role model to look up to in the gaming industry. Has that changed at all? Uh, do you feel like you've become the role model for others? Yeah, I think that was kind of one of the blessings of working with my brother because, um, you know, there wasn't really anyone uh, in the gaming industry doing development and stuff, at least not publicly, that I felt looked like me or acted like me or whatnot. So um, one of the blessings that we had was to be able to kind of rely on each other. So, you know, when we were struggling with something um, and maybe we see people around us who are excelling and maybe uh, we don't feel like we can relate to them or what we're not comfortable relating to them or whatnot, uh, we were able to relate yeah. to each other. So we kind of, and that wasn't just a school, even now on and, you know, past school and into our careers and everything, we're able to rely on each other, help each other out and kind of give each other that, that confidence. And we're hoping that, yeah. you know, us along with others who we've met along the way in the industry after that, um, we can give that confidence to younger people who are coming up and maybe looking to, to find role models, um, whether it's people of color, women, really anyone yeah. who really needs that uh, reliance who can't find it. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Ahmed, um, what has been rewarding um, for you about holding space for underrepresented groups in game developing? Um, and also what has been a challenge when standing up as a role model? Yeah, I mean, as Khalil said, it's definitely a challenge when you're in the industry where you only represent 1% of the game developers. Um, and mm -hmm. we used to represent a significant amount more um, of the actual consumer. Um, and that just that balance just doesn't it's just not acceptable. So when you go into this industry, you want to be a thought leader and be able to open doors uh, for others while making sure that you are, you know, being a great role model to actually break through and create games that are great. What we try to focus on, yeah. you know, is definitely giving a platform for black excellence for underrepresented communities. And we got to be able to do that, but also make sure we're always opening our doors and going to places so we can teach that. You know, as we're developing some sanity, one of the things we really focused on while we were right deep in development, you know, we went to boys and girls clubs. Uh, we held events uh, such as Game On back in February to focus on black excellence and people that are doing great things in the industry, but also just going to schools and teaching and showing that there is a path. And, you know, once and I feel like we've, you know, as people of color, we've always had an opportunity to eventually break into different industries, whether it's music, uh, movies, and entertainment. And we've always been able to revolutionize the area. So it's just a matter of time we get to do that in gaming. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. And speaking of Swim Sanity and developing Swim Sanity, um, Khalil, maybe talk a little bit about how you made that jump from developing Swim Sanity to starting Decoy Games. I mean, they kind of went hand in hand because Swim Sanity was our first um, like inaugural game. Um, and we always wanted to make sure that we focused on the game first. Um, yeah. Now, while we did that, we wanted to also make sure we established a brand. And I think this kind of, you know, our family before us, they're, they're a lot of them are entrepreneurs. Um, and also the main job we worked on this while doing this on the side, we were, we we're sales um, solutions consultants. So kind of understanding how to build a brand um, really went into what we were doing. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, we're making a really fun game, but at the same time, we're establishing a brand for ourselves. And the brand is really there so we can get our message out to people who we're connecting to beyond the game. So um, they did go hand in hand and kind of rely on each other. Yeah, nice. All right, so I I think the best way for the audience to get a feel of your game is if we actually play it. So how do you guys think about us playing a little bit of some sanity right now as I ask more questions? And we'll take some questions from the audience too. You're all ready. <laughs> okay, all right, so I am gonna bring Carla in and Carla and I will be playing alongside the both of you. Um, so let's see. Oh no, I'm actually really nervous yep. right now. I can't. I'm about to jump in the match. Hold on one sec. One sec. I'm always late. Here we go. Finding the room. For nine, six, nine, five. Okay. Let's do this. All right. All right. All right, so if anyone has questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. But I will try to play and ask questions at the same time. We'll see how this goes. Oh, who do I want to be? Yeah, so right now everyone is selecting their Unleash. So before you enter any of our game modes, which are playing Co-op Adventure, Deep Blue, you know, everyone gets to select their like big super move they get to do during a match. So I am going uh -huh. to select a Shock. And All right, I'm the medic. Oh my gosh. All right, Carla, you are the medic, so if we die, it is your fault. <laughs> you must revive us. Oh, I'm so nervous. 
I've never had the power. Um, okay, so we've got a, we do have a question from Jason already. The work and passion balance is so key. So cool to hear how it's done from the pros. Um, we, um, we could use this to ask them if they still have fun gaming. Okay. Do you guys still have fun gaming or is it just like become a job and how, um, how do you keep that balance of work and fun when gaming? Yeah, I mean, I work so I can game more, to be honest with you. So um, I'm still playing. I play every night, sometimes during the day, sometimes during my lunch break. So um, we got into yeah. this because of our love of gaming. And the more that we do this, I start to love gaming even more. Um, but yeah, oh, I'm playing nice. all the time. Oh, oh my gosh, here we like go. Right now? <laughs> Don't worry, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make sure we make it through this. Okay. Let's go, um, Green Road Tripper. Road Tripper. Some insider <laughs> tips you have for people playing this. Oh, oh shoot. Um, for people playing the game, some sanity or just yeah. game yeah. dev. Um, don't get stuck behind the foreground. That'd be tip number one. Green, green. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. I totally was looking at the wrong one. Oh no, I'm right. stuck. <laughs> What are some oh, tips? Actually, can, um, hold down. Yeah, what are some tips? Always hold down the fire button. Like people oh. think that you just have to keep tapping it. You can just hold it down and just keep oh. firing. Oh, um, okay, okay. Noted. Okay. Let's I'm see. Doing so uh, much keep forward. <laughs> you know, don't feel like you need to take out every single person. Communicate. You guys breathe. are falling behind. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! I'm getting stuck again. It's not even pick hard up the... yet, guys. We haven't had the big wheels on this yet. <laughs> there we go. Like... <laughs> when you pick up your right. blue items at your secondaries, you can fire those left trigger. They give you a bit more oomph to your firing. All right, we're about nice. to bring back the green person. Oh, yes. You're back green. Me. You're back green. Okay, I'm yep. back. I'm back. You're going to want to go. There so you go. This is... Oh, no. Dude, oh. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, I am not doing too well here. So I'm going to continue asking you questions. Okay, how how do you decide like how to make the difficulty of these games? Because this is really hard. So you want me to take that one on? Anyway, <laughs> so difficulty was yeah, actually, yeah. Um, believe, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, difficulty is key for us because we wanted to make sure the game is enjoyable yet yeah, challenging. So you, it's a lot of testing, a lot of play the game, all different ages. Um, but we also had a diff bunch of different games show different levels of difficulty. So, Adventure is probably one of the more challenging game modes. And we have our survival, which is a little more casual, and you're kind of sitting in back on the game. So, oh, Carla is gone. Carla, explain yourself here. What is going on? Another tip is to use your teleport. So, you, you when you press the A button on controller, you can do this little phase through thing where you can go through enemies and foreground and stuff. So when you are getting stuck, it's a good way to get out of it. You guys are back now. You guys are back. Oh, okay, okay. Let me try this again. All right, can you actually talk us through, like, how did you, how did you create this? Like, what, what are we seeing right now? That, like, what sort of language that you had to use or to create all of these moving parts here? Yeah, so from the development side, um, we're using Unity for the game engine. And for those who don't know, Unity, um, from a coding side, uses mostly uh, C-sharp. Um, and it's a lot of like object-oriented programming. Uh, Unity is also kind of a visually driven um, game engine, similar to like, you know, Unreal mm -hmm. and Construct and whatnot. So um, it's a lot of kind of like building the actual levels and stuff then going back and doing the coding. Ready, Blue Road Shipper? Uh -huh. Come on, Carla. Oh my gosh, no. Oh my gosh. I can <laughs> she, she thought she was over. I was talking about. Um, did learning these languages come easy for you guys? I mean, um, so I would, when you, I think the computer science definitely helped uh, making sure of just learning new languages and learning the engine. But like I said, I feel like the internet has been an amazing place to just find out how to learn things and there's some really great tutorials on there. So going up there and there's really stuff for beginners. There's even visual scripting now where you don't have to code at all. And you can code a pretty yeah. decent game without even doing any code. So there's a lot of different options for people. Are there any games that you guys have made just, just for fun? 
So the the funny thing with Swim Sanity, you're back, Blue. The funny thing with Swim Sanity is that we did it in so many iterations because we were literally like teaching ourselves how to make games. And um, like every iteration was almost a different game. Like Swim Sanity started off with like, there were like mechs in the game at, at a certain point. At another point, it was like a single player, almost like Mega Man game with a story that was just like too serious for us to even like take on at the time. And this was just yeah. like the last oh. version that we even had like a Facebook version of the game too. So um, we've really been like married to some sanity through the whole process of us learning how to make games. Um, that doesn't mean you have to stick to one thing, by the way, if, that, if this is something that you're interested in doing. Um, that's just the process Let's that we go. took. Oh, just oh, sorry, glad I had to interrupt you because Carla oh, just made it to the end. She made it to the end. Yeah. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> wow, can I just be your professional gamer? <laughs> uh, I always believed in you. I always believed in you. Just want to let you know. Thank Let's you, thank go. You. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sweating, you guys. Oh, man. oh my gosh, you have no idea. I'm like, okay, questions, questions, and then I look on the screen and I'm already dead. <laughs> okay, we we do have a question from Ben here. What part of the development process is the most fun to work on? Ooh. It's different yeah. for it's different for everyone. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ahmed. Yeah, I mean, I like so much of it. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we actually are just starting on our concept right now for our next game, and it really feels great to just start from a fresh slate. So I do like the design part um, quite a bit. Just kind of coming up with something from nothing is a really cool feeling when things start to come together. So uh, that's probably my favorite part. Nice. Um, I can say my, my oh, least yeah. favorite part is building like menus. I hate that. Can't stand it. I wish that there was a button that you could uh, press to do it. My most favorite part is probably like level design and then like character coming up with kind of different characters and stuff. Yeah. Oh, nice. And um, uh, we have two people here, Letta and Haley. They both say, I got to play this game. So we've got some yes. people excited to play. This. I don't know if that's a question, but the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the future? Like, what does Decoy Games have in store for the future? Any projects you're excited about? Yeah, we're so yeah. we're working on our concept right now for our next game. It's going to be much larger, really innovative experience than Swim Sandy. We love what we did here, but we feel like we just this game just kind of got us into the door, and now we're really going to show everybody you know, our capability, what we can do in this industry. So that's all we could say for right now. Um, but, um, yeah. you know, soon we'll definitely be showing you uh, what we got in, what we got in stock for you. Yeah, oh, we're, we're so excited. So for those of you still playing some Sandy, we're here, still here to support as well. Nice. Uh, and what about any um, Last words or advice that you want to give to people who, you know, want to do what you two are doing or just getting into the industry? Yeah, um, I would say start today. So um, a yeah. lot of people have the tendency when they want to get into something new to wait either because they don't think that they're good enough yet or they want to like make everything perfect. Start right now. Um, every day that you mm -hmm. wait is just a day lost if you're not um, doing anything, even if you're just you know, watching a YouTube video online or going through a tutorial or anything that that's progress is progress. So always make sure that if you want to start now, start today, make sure you're always learning something and moving forward and uh, move at your own pace. Yeah. Awesome. Ahmed, any last words or advice? <laughs> I'm literally still playing while we're supposed to. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. As you said, no, start today um, as I'm surviving here. Um, yeah, online guys, all the information's online. There's so much you can do to jump in there. You don't have to necessarily, um, go through these different things. There's so many different ways to learn game development. Um, so I say, just start looking on YouTube videos, download unity engine. It's free. Uh, I think they actually offered a lot of their tutorials for free online. They're pr premium ones. So go ahead and download those. Um, other than that, awesome. I'm whooping at some sanity, go download some sanity. It's out on all platforms, <laughs> and I don't know what else, Khalil. All that good stuff. Yeah, get some sand right now. It's like I said, it's free. My games of gold for like one more week. It's also Nintendo Switch, PlayStation, um, Steam. Follow us, Decoy Games, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. 
Decoy Games Apparel, if you guys want some cool swag. Sorry, I don't know if we were supposed to push things or not, but it's there now. So. Oh, yeah. Go Follow for us. it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That was so fun. I mean, obviously, I fun. need to practice more. But thank you all for letting me play. And thank you all for playing with us and joining us today. Um, I loved hearing about your story. Um, but, yeah, thank you guys so much. We appreciate your time um, and sharing all these tips and tricks with us, too. Absolutely. Love y'all. Cool. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Khalil. Thanks, Ahmed. Thanks for having us. Take care. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right, you've seen how much fun you can have playing video games, and there's a lot you can do with the background in computer science. The possibilities are only expanding as the technology continues to play a part in our everyday lives. Jenny, I'm actually going to need your help to explore some of those paths, so let's play the first round. Okay, let's go. All right, who we got here? Character Rigger, tell us a little bit more about that, Carla. Yeah, this is for our stick figure drawing friends. <laughs> you can use computer programs to build the skeletons of characters. So you pick the bones apart, you put them back together again, forming them, deforming them. All right, let's play another round. Okay. okay. Ooh, technical Ooh. artist. Tell me more about that. Yeah, as a technical artist, you bring art to life. So you basically animate game art by writing its computer code. Okay, let's do one more round. Virtual reality engineer. Ooh, that one sounds exciting. Yeah, you actually got a preview of virtual reality back uh, during Maya's interview. So if you're tired of this one, you can spend your time designing a new reality. Use computer technology to create experiences that completely immerse users into other worlds. If I had to pick, I'd probably choose being a technical artist because I know I already like art and writing and those are combined with science when you're a technical artist. So I can totally imagine myself writing a language that brings art to life. Drop the job you would choose in the chat. Thanks for joining for Cool Jobs with Carla. All right, thank you all for joining us today for Road Trip Nation's cross section where your interests and computer science intersect. If you had fun or if you want to learn more about where computer science can take you, make sure to subscribe to our channel and check out the rest of our cross section events. I'm Jenny and I will see you next time. Thanks all.